There's a roll. It's a lot easier at 3G's. Run the space, everyone. Yeah. Good to be back. I don't remember liftoff being quite that violent. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Why did you want to be an astronaut? Uh, for me, it, w it wasn't, I, I know some people say that they, you know, they knew from a very early age that that's what they wanted to do, and, and that's, that's awesome. But it wasn't quite that way for me. I, I think I was a little more practical about things, and uh, I was interested in space flight, and I was interested in airplanes at a very young age. I can remember that from way back, and I think it was just a natural progression of things, uh, being interested in engineering, being interested in in aviation and space and it just kind of led me down a path uh, into college in the military and then in the Marine Corps flying fighters and then uh, ultimately as a test pilot and then to be lucky enough to get to come here um, it just kind of was that next job that interested me or that I had the prerequisites for that I could try for and uh, it, it progressed such that I showed up here at the uh, doorstep of NASA about 10 years ago. Not satisfied with what you were doing, looking for something else? Well, I think it's just a case of you, I've always been one, and I, I, I think that's fairly common in our office, is to, to kind of set goals for this particular, what, what you're doing this week or this month or this year, and then set goals, longer term goals. And, and it just seemed like all those different interests all kind of coalesced uh, to what would be described as the job description for an astronaut. And so I think naturally it just progressed to that point and obviously I was lucky enough to get to be chosen to come here. I'm going to take you to the other end of that story. Start, uh, tell me about your hometown and what it was like to grow up there. Well, I grew up in Apple Lake in New York, which is a very, very small town in the southern tier of upstate New York. And uh, I, I mean, it was just a, a wonderful place to grow up. It was a very small town. It was fairly rural. Um, I had a lot of close friends, played sports, uh, downhill skied, did all the things that I think you know most folks from that part of the country do and uh, and really enjoyed it. It's a great place to be from and it's I, I always look forward to getting back there. Do you have a sense of how the place and, and the people who are there really contributed to making you who you are? Well, I, I always kind of felt like I needed to give something back to the, uh, you know, you have this sense of service to the country uh, and I I don't know where it came from, um, but I had that from a fairly early age that I wanted to do something for the country, you know, serve the country, and the military seemed like the best way to do that. And uh, and I think you see that from the people that I grew up with that they're they're very patriotic and and love their country, and I think it just carried over to a degree in me personally, and then uh, and then the the mutual benefit of getting to fly airplanes. Uh, for the military was just a great experience. Do you get to make out your hometown from orbit? I've seen it a few times. Uh, the weather in upstate New York can't always be, or isn't always cooperative. Uh, there, it tends to be cloudy there a fair amount of the time, but I've seen it a few times on my previous flight. Um, take, take us from, from that point, from high school and on, and, and what, what were some of the, the highlights, you think, in your education, your professional yeah. career, and your military career that ultimately led you here? Well, I think the, the first big decision, I think, was, was uh, the combination of going to school on a, on a Navy ROTC scholarship. So I, was a, I, I actually was a Marine option, as the Marines are part of the Department of the Navy. Both Marines and Navy officers can go through the Navy ROTC. Uh, that was a, obviously a big decision, and then uh, taking engineering in college at Tulane University uh, was probably the other, you know, major milestone that kind of led me down that path to be a, a, a pilot and then a test pilot. What make, what gets a kid from upstate New York to Tulane? Yeah, that's a good question. I get that a lot. Um, I think it was as much. Uh, maybe seeing another part of the world as anything, and I think the other part of it was. Uh, I was hoping to get somewhere where it was a little warmer in the winter time. So those are probably the two biggest things. And, um, you know, New Orleans intrigued me. It was, you know, it's just something totally different than what I grew up with. And, uh, and it ended up 
just being a wonderful place to go to college. So you go to college on the ROTC scholarship mm -hmm. studying engineering? That's correct. Uh, studied engineering. I had a great professor, uh, Dr. Robert Bruce, who kind of was, you know, that one person uh, in academia in college that really pushed me. He was uh, a structural uh, engineering instructor, professor, and uh, just really enjoyed uh, civil engineering while I was there. And uh, because it would have been easy to do something different. Engineering is a fairly challenging degree. And then with all your other competing priorities with ROTC and, and just college life in general in New Orleans, as you might imagine, you're, you were pretty busy. Um, but it was a, you know, I really enjoyed it. And, and getting that degree uh, paid huge dividends down the road because that's what got me into test pilot school is having a, an engineering degree. Uh, not only being a fighter pilot, but having that degree as well. But that's not your first stop when you got your degree in the Marines. No. You. So then, you know, once we graduate, we're commissioned as an officer in the in the Marine Corps, and then I was off to Quantico, Virginia, for several months of what they call the basic school in the Marine Corps, which really means every Marine officer is a, a ground slash infantry officer first, and then once you finish that school, uh, then you're afforded the opportunity to go do what you intended to do, your discipline, whether it be a uh, a tank driver, an airplane driver, uh, an infantry officer. Uh, so I spent some time in Quantico and, and then after that was on my way down to Pensacola and uh, flight school was a long process. It was Pensacola to start with and Corpus Christi, Texas where I actually started flying airplanes and then I finished up flight school in Meridian, Mississippi in jet training and got my wings in uh, 1991 and then was off to the west coast uh, to fly F-18s, uh, and I spent several years out there operationally flying F-18s in the Marines. They finally got you off the Gulf Coast. Yeah, for uh, little did I know, I was going to be back. <laughs> well, and take this to, through the last step of that. You're yeah. a, you're a Marine officer now, and how did you end up astronaut? Yeah, that's a that's a I get that a lot too because everybody kind of wonders. Well, how did you end up there? And uh, I had flown uh, operationally uh, in a in a F-18 frontline F-18 fighter squadron for uh, it was a better part of four and a half years, and uh, a couple of my commanding officers, while I was in that particular squadron, had said, you know, you ought to consider test pilot school. Uh, you know, with the engineering background, and I said, you know, asked them a lot of questions about it, and they knew that I had some desire that I, you know, considered being an astronaut, and they said, you know, that is probably a way to go. Um, and so I kind of looked into it and uh, applied to test pilot school uh, and was accepted at the Navy test pilot school, which is in Patuxent River, Maryland. And so in 1996, I left the West Coast. At that time, it was, uh, I was at Miramar in San Diego and uh, went to uh, test pilot school for a year at uh, Patuxent River, Maryland. The one thing they don't touch you, tell you about test pilot school is that after being out of college for eight or nine years, it's like going into an intensive aeronautical engineering master's program. So it was a little bit of uh, denial there for the first few months getting back into the academics, but, uh, but a very rewarding experience. Got to fly a number of different airplanes over the next year. And then uh, once you graduate from test pilot school, then you become an operational test pilot uh, for typically a two to three year tour and I stayed in Patuxent River and uh, was involved in several uh, F-18 uh, flight test projects as well as flying the new F-18 Super Hornet. Uh, so uh, it was a great experience, loved living there. It was actually the closest I'd been to home in my entire military career so that was nice as well. And it was while I was there as the operations officer for the test squadron that I was, uh, that I had applied and then subsequently gotten picked to come down to NASA. And you got here and, and have taken a job that, not unlike test pilot, uh, has its own share of risks, albeit maybe slightly different ones. Mm -hmm. But Doug, what is it that you think that we're getting or, or learning as a result of flying people in space that makes that risk worth, one worth taking? Well, I, I think you see a, a, number of, a number of benefits. I mean, we've, all this technology that we gain from space flight has, you know, has become such a fabric of our lives that it's, that it's just incredible to see. Uh, and that alone, in my mind, is worth the risk. But just to explore, you know, to explore low Earth orbit, to explore that next, you know, the moon as we did before, is well worth the risk of a single person or, or a few people. 
to get those answers, to see what's out there, to see if there was life on other planets. So for me, uh, obviously flying fighters my whole life, I've, I've come to grips with the risk years ago and, uh, and, and it really hasn't changed for me in that regard. So this just seems like a, just another day at, day at the office. You are one of four crew members on the final flight of Space Shuttle Atlantis. Doug, could you give me a, a summary of the work that's planned on STS-135 and what your jobs are going to be? Well, obviously my position in the crew is as the pilot, but uh, primarily we are trying to get the station in a position where it can last without being resupplied significantly for over a year. So we are taking up a fully loaded MPLM, multi-purpose logistics module, uh, to, to, to supply station uh, for that amount of time and to keep, uh, keep things rolling as far as that goes. Now you guys are going up with only four astronauts on board Atlantis. Why just four this time? Yeah, that's a great question. We haven't flown uh, a four-person crew since STS-6, uh, so we, we obviously don't take this lightly, but the, the combination of, of a couple different things uh, kind of drove the crew to size to that number. Uh, the primary one being that, you know, since return to flight, STS-114, we've had a sh shuttle in a, in a position where it could provide a rescue uh, for the previous shuttle if there was a problem with the heat shield that we discovered on orbit. And uh, obviously, being the last shuttle flight, we don't have that option. So in order to, to facilitate a, uh, a potential rescue scenario, we have to come down on uh, Soyuz uh, rockets. And uh, after, you know, some consideration, uh, we would have to stay uh, on the order of three months for the first person up to a year for the last person by the time we come down. So four successive Soyuz flights would bring down one person at a time over the course of the following year that they declared a rescue. You say if you had a larger crew, it would take longer to get everybody home. Yeah, it just adds to that. And I think uh, most folks are comfortable with uh, allowing a crew member under, under those particular circumstances to remain in space for a year. But once you start pushing things out beyond a year, that, that that requires a lot more uh, consideration and thought. How do you feel about the idea of maybe coming home on a Soyuz or spending an extra year in space? Well, I, I looked at it a couple ways. I remember uh, when Peggy Whitson uh, called, me into the called me into her office and said, uh, I've got some, uh, some good news for you. And uh, I said, what, what's that? She goes, I'd like you to be the pilot on STS-135. And I said, well, of course. And, I said, is there something else? And she said, well, right now it looks like you would be the last person to come down if there was a rescue declared. And I was like, hmm. I thought about it for a few minutes and I said, well, let me look at it this way. I've got nine months of shuttle training uh, for this flight, vice the two and a half years that most folks typically train to go on ISS for six months. So I told her, I said, well, it's a bargain at any price, so I'll take it. Yep, so in, the, in this rescue scenario, you'd be the fourth of four. That's what it's looking like, yeah, that's correct. Um, the last one down, uh, at least the current way, Sandy and I would be the last two, and, and it's because we've got uh, the robotics in the mix as well as EVA, and because you, you essentially become a de facto member of the space station crew because they're not, you know, if this rescue was declared, they're not gonna fly people up uh, in that empty seat because they need it for us to come down. So we have to assume uh, at least some sort of a role as a as a crew member on space station. So that's the way they they've sorted it out. Now you have been to the space station before. All four of you have been there. That's and of correct. Course Sandy has had a long duration mission there. Mm -hmm. Has that experience among the four of you been helpful as you prepared for this flight? It has been invaluable. Um, Sandy is uh, she's amazing. She flew a, a shuttle flight back in I believe 2002 SDS 112. And you would not have known it's been eight plus years since she's flown. Uh, it was just amazing what she remembers from that flight. And then the additional space station expertise has just been, uh, I, I mean, it's been great because there's not that concern that if, you know, no kidding, if this rescue scenario happens to come into play, and obviously the likelihood is extremely small that that would happen, you know, Sandy would jump right into the role of uh, our continuing instructor while we're on space station because obviously living there for six months she knows all the ins and outs obviously it's changed slightly since she's been there but 
you know, the general philosophies on, on how the station operates, the, the science, the experiments, as well as just the day-to-day -day things that you need to do on space stations. She's been invaluable kind of offering her insight as we've gone through this training. And it's not like you and Chris and Rex have, don't have any experience at it. Yeah, that, that's true. I mean, we've all had uh, missions to the space station, um, and, and it does feel a little different this time. And there was a lot of that unknown on my first flight uh, where you just didn't know what to expect getting to the space station and, and then how you'd fit into the whole crew mix. And I think that part of it is it definitely feels a little easier this time, uh, having been there once before. What are you looking forward to seeing on the station when you get back there? Um, I'm sure this is an answer that a lot of people uh, probably give you, but I, I, it's got to be the cupola. Just the, the pictures that I've seen out of the cupola have been unbelievable and and knowing having been in space before and looking out a window it's it's there's no camera that can capture that vividness the just the stunning views that you see out the window so um, with the cupola having un unobstructed views of the planet and the space station uh, I, I that's probably what I'm looking forward to the most just getting in there and and hopefully having five minutes to, to look out the window without having to do something else you and your crewmates are bringing up, well, a shuttle full of supplies <laughs> to the International Space Station. Give us a sense of the kinds of, of things. What kind of cargo are you guys bringing up to orbit? Um, we are bringing up the uh, multipurpose logistics module, Raffaello, uh, and about uh, the number changes, uh, it seems like weekly, but roughly 16,000 pounds of uh, material. That would include food, uh, on the order of a year's worth of food for the ISS crew, um, spare parts, replacement parts, uh, some scientific experiments we're taking up. Uh, I think the latest number is eight mid-deck payloads, um, uh, three sets of uh, mouse enclosures, so 24 mice uh, that we're, we're doing studies on with regards to osteoporosis. So you name it, we're, we're taking it up there. And obviously this is to just put the station in its best possible uh, stature for uh, the post-shuttle era uh, so that from a large supply standpoint, it is taken care of. And as far as replacement parts, it's, it's taken care of at least for the near future. As you said, some of this is coming up in the mid-deck. The bulk of it is going to be inside the MPLM. That's correct. Now, MPLMs used to get docked to the underside of the Unity node, but now there's a permanent module there. Yeah. Does the fact that that's out there now create any, any changes for the way the robotics uh, operation will, will be to install Raffaello now on the underside of, of node 2? Um, not a significant amount. It, it, it's going to be in all your camera views because it's going to be right next to uh, Raffaello when we install it. But uh, generally speaking, it, it actually ends up being, I think, a little closer to the shuttle. So it's, uh, from that respect, it, it's not a significant difference as far as the installation uh, robotically. But uh, it's definitely something we have to pay attention to because the clearances obviously uh, are much smaller. It's something new that may be in the, uh, the theater of operations. That's right. Uh, this mission also features one spacewalk on flight day five. But unlike previous shuttle flights, on this one, uh, station crew members are going to be going outside. What's the reason for that assignment? Well, I think it, it, uh, it's a couple things. One, uh, Ron Guerin and uh, Mike Fossum have done EVAs previously. Uh, and. Uh, coincidentally together on STS-124. Uh, so they have a significant amount of experience. I believe they did three together on that flight. Um, that being one, and the other, we kind of fall back on the same thing. We are a four-person crew, and uh, we had about eight or nine months to prepare for this mission. And just from a preparation standpoint, and the other things that we had to do regarding training, we just kind of thought that that was a better way to do it and spread the spread the load around the entire docked crew rather than just place it all on the uh, shuttle crew because typically you have seven people and we could have had two people concentrate uh, primarily on EVA whereas on this flight everybody has to attend almost every training evolution that we have. However, it's not to say that we're not going to be deeply involved with the EVA. Um, Sandy and I will be providing robotic support throughout the EVA and uh, Rex is going to be the IV for the EVA, so the quarterback for the EVA. Um, so, and I think that 
you know, pretty much says uh, volumes about the shuttle station team and how, you know, we're just going to put this whole thing together on orbit. And uh, it's kind of been a neat way to do our, our training. Well, let's talk about what, what's going to happen there. And from the perspective of, of the ARM operations particularly, uh, take me through the timeline as it exists today okay. of the, the spacewalk and what are these guys going to be doing out there? Well, uh, the, the, the big purpose of the spacewalk is, uh, is twofold, uh, you know, at least from a robotic standpoint. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, retrieve the failed pump module that we had last summer. Uh, and put it back in the payload bay, the shuttle payload bay, to bring it back to Earth so that the engineers can kind of study, study it more closely and, and determine what exactly caused it to fail. Because obviously, it's a very important part of the space station. It provides uh, cooling for the space station, and uh, we need to understand why it failed. So that's the first thing. And then the next, uh, the next big objective uh, from a robotic standpoint is we're going to uh, detach the robotics refueling module, RRM, uh, from the uh, payload bay, which we, we brought up along with the MPLM, and uh, attach it to station right next to the SPDM. So those are the two big, uh, the two big events, and then there's a, uh, a number of other get-aheads, what we call get-aheads, that uh, we're going to try to accomplish while Ron and Mike are outside. And uh, as you know from previous flights, those get-aheads and those priorities typically change uh, almost weekly as we get up towards the flight. And I think uh, some portion of that will depend on how much 134's spacewalk teams get accomplished and then we may pick up some of the things that they don't do or if they end up doing some of these get-aheads, we may do some other ones instead. Since they won't need them done then. Exactly. From the robotics operator's perspective, mm -hmm. how, uh, how easy or hard are the, uh, are the operations for the pump module and the RRM? Well, I think anytime you're involving uh, a spacewalker on the end of the arm and close clearances, it's always fairly intense. Um, we had a fair amount of that on, on my previous flight on SCS-127, and, and this will be very similar, where we'll have both Ron and Mike on the end of the arm either retrieving the pump module or the robotics refueling uh, module and, and placing them in their appropriate uh, final areas. Uh, and you know, it, within the payload bay, it's going to be very tight clearances. And then when we uh, go to get the pump module, that's over uh, on the uh, starboard side of the space station and some fairly tight clearances on one of the ESPs. And then uh, when we put the robotics refueling module back on space station, it's right near the SPDM and right near the U.S. lab. So there's, there will be a fair amount of vigilance, obviously, by us on the uh, robotics arm, our robotic arm, as well as the folks down in Mission Control. Now, your area of operations here are all relatively close to one that, another. That is very correct. Yeah, it, it's kind of going to be a back and forth between kind of the center portion of the station near the lab uh, down to the payload bay and back. Uh, so ideally, we'll have some fairly good views out the window with the cupola based on its location, which is something obviously that Sandy and I have never had the luxury of having, uh, which should uh, really help us as far as, as that goes because uh, previous to this both Sandy and I's experiences have been with the robotic station in the uh, US lab where there were no windows and you were just purely dependent on uh, station camera views as well as some of the shuttle views as well. Yeah from the underside of node 3 right there the, uh, just behind the lab you should be able to see virtually every place you're going here I guess except the ESP. That's what we're hoping. So we're, we're really looking forward to just being able to look out the window to give ourselves clearances, which obviously one look out the window is worth a thousand camera views. So uh, hopefully that's, you know, we've, we've used it in VR, practiced it in VR, virtual reality lab, and uh, it looks like we should have great views out the window. Once the spacewalk is over with, uh, the combined crews are scheduled for a lot of transfer work. Is that a lot of transfer work? <laughs> a lot of transfer work? Yeah, that's... Uh, that is the understatement, I think, of the mission. I think, you know, we're going to do transfer, then we're going to transfer, then we're going to do more transfer, and then we'll throw an EBA in the middle of it, I think is how uh, we have referred to it as, because the MPLM is going to be packed full, um, literally, uh, and it's going to take a long time to unpack it. And then, unlike the previous mission, STS-133, where they left the MPLM up there um, with a fair amount of uh, cargo still in it, um, we have to empty it out completely, and then there is a, a laundry list of things that we are going to bring back from space station. So you're kind of 
packing and unpacking a house uh, twice, I think is probably the best way to say it. Well, you're packing and unpacking two houses at the same time <laughs> in the same space. That's correct, and uh, we are beyond thankful that Sandy is going to be the one uh, on orbit that's going to uh, run the choreography for this. She's, uh, she's a consummate professional, and uh, we, uh, we just are trying not to get her upset with us. Can you give us a, a good sense of what it's, what, what does it take in terms of, of not just moving things back and forth, that's pretty straightforward, but also knowing where everything is supposed to go and, and knowing where it is at, the, at, at any given time? Yeah, that's, that's the thing with transfer, and I discovered this on, uh, on my previous flight, and I know Chris and Rex and Sandy as well have talked about this on their previous flights. You have to be meticulous with your bookkeeping you have to be meticulous with your plan and you can't move something out of the MPLM until you have a place to put it in the space station and then vice versa. You can't move something back into the MPLM until its spot has opened up from what we brought up. So it, it is a huge amount of choreography that the ground teams have to work on as well as obviously us on orbit. Uh, otherwise you're going to have these huge traffic jams in the middle of the space station and, and we don't have the room for that. So it's, it's got to be very well organized and uh, I can't think of anybody better to do the, uh, the bookkeeping and organizing than Sandy. I guess you got to be prepared not just to follow the script though, but to, to deal with, the, to ad lib if it's called for. I think so. And I, you know, Sandy has a great plan as far as, you know, where we can temporarily stow things as we move things back and forth, as well as what we need to do in the mid deck. And, and it will require a little bit of ad libbing. It may require some, you know, working after hours. It may require some, you know, extra game game planning uh, at night before we start the next day to kind of figure out how we want to attack this every day because it is a it is literally a mountain of of things that we're taking up to space station and when you're done with all of that when the joint timeline is done the four of you are going to mark a milestone with the last undocking of the space shuttle from the international space station anything special on the plan for the for the undocking operation itself uh, I, I think generally speaking no but I probably wouldn't tell you if we had something <laughs> it wouldn't be a surprise um, but I th generally you know it will be a typical undock day um, with a slight twist we're gonna our fly around is gonna involve uh, the station yawing to one one side 90 degrees to one side so when we do the fly around rather than over the center portion of the space station we're going to go over kind of the long axis of the space station and, and get some views that we haven't seen of the space station in, in a very long time if ever uh, and this will also help folks on the ground be able to document any specific areas of interest or micrometeorite damage that the station has had um, as we move forward into the post shuttle era so it should be uh, that in and, in and of itself should be a fairly unique uh, fly around. For the man at the controls, does that really, does that change the fly around task much for you? It really doesn't. Um, you know, the profile is essentially the same, albeit the, you know, your point of view with regard to station is, is 90 degrees different, but uh, the profile is essentially the same. So it shouldn't change the procedures as far as onboard the shuttle uh, drastically at all. They're You're flying good. the same loop exact same loop although the last we had talked about this based on the time required and obviously our our entire timeline is managed very closely and it seems like this flight even more so because of the number of people and the amount of things we're trying to accomplish uh, we probably will not be able to do an entire 360 degree fly around it would rather just be uh, at least as they currently plan 180 degree fly around so the top half of the space station or the top side. Top no, side, the, yeah. Whatever, It'll make a lot is. more sense when we do it. <laughs> <laughs> is there going to be anything special you're going to keep your eyes peeled for during that last fly around and then that final separation? Um, I, I don't, I, I mean, that view is, is unbelievable already. So I, I think that's just taking that view in one more time. Uh, I know we've, we've, we've sent back video of, of the fly rounds and it's just incredible as the sun comes up and lights up the solar arrays you can see the shadow of the orbiter on the arrays it's just it's a one-of-a-kind view and I think for me personally that's what I'll be looking at and, uh, and obviously trying to maintain all the parameters that we're required to maintain and then you know once again all the other folks will be very busy doing other things too but I think we'll be able to manage a, a glimpse or two at space station as we get ready to go
When you were assigned to this mission, it was going to be a rescue flight for the last space shuttle mission. Of course, the plans for that have changed. What was your reaction when you realized, hey, I'm going to be on the last space shuttle mission? Uh, I, you know, it's a mix of uh, emotions. Obviously, you're excited. Any any space flight is a great space flight, and uh, y you know, the reality that this is the you know the last flight in the program. I think sets in to a degree. Obviously, the biggest thing is you're just count your blessings. You're honored. You're humbled. Uh, you're lucky, uh, and very thankful. I think are are some of the things that went through my head. And then then the reality of it set in that. All right, we gotta. This is going to be a real flight, and you know we got four people and a lot to do. So I think, especially in the last few months, that's been the biggest. Uh, challenge is just trying to get all this together with only four of us it's been it's been very busy so there is a special sense of of honor or and maybe responsibility to be on this particular mission it's a huge responsibility because you you want to you want to represent the thousands and thousands of people that have worked probably their entire careers i i don't know how many people that we've talked to or met that have been in the space shuttle program since sts1 and Nothing means more, I think, to all four of us than to, to honor that legacy and, and, and go out with as best a mission as we can fly. Well, as you, you know very well, the end of the program means a lot of changes at NASA, including people, layoffs, mm -hmm. uh, closing some historic facilities. What's your feeling about the decision that was made to stop flying these vehicles? Well, I, I would imagine it was a, an incredibly difficult decision on so many so many fronts. Um, I understand it. Uh, there's a there's a logical end for all programs. Obviously, coming from a military background, I've seen airplanes fly out their their service lives and be retired, and it's just a natural progression. And uh, you know, fiscally, it was a decision that needed to be made. You know. We, we've got priorities at NASA, we've got things we want to do outside of low Earth orbit, and uh, the decision was made to, to go that direction. And, uh, and it's probably time, but it's, it doesn't make it any easier for, for uh, the folks that fly it, and I know it doesn't make it any easier for the folks that have worked on it their whole careers. But you know, we just want them to, to know uh, that, that what they've accomplished is, is incredible, and uh, we'll do our best to, to finish this program the way it deserves to be finished. The end of the program is reflected in some of the elements of the patch that you guys have for your mission. Tell That's me correct. about what, what we're seeing in that, in that patch. What are those elements? Well, we, we kind of went for a couple different themes uh, with the patch, and as you may or may not know, the, the, the crews are, are the ones that end up designing the patch, which is a, which is a great honor. Uh, we did ask for a lot of advice from family, from friends, from other folks around the different centers, uh, what they would like to see, and of course, we got about as many ideas as we, uh, that we could possibly handle. Um, but we wanted to keep it simple. We wanted to represent in, in some way the program as a whole. Uh, and we kind of did that with a little bit of a, a, little bit of a uh, design that looked similar to the STS-1 patch. And then, of course, the Omega, I think, is the other big, uh, one of the other big uh, aspects of the patch, which is the, Greek, the last Greek uh, letter in the alphabet for the last flight. Um, a not so subtle. Uh, uh, maybe subtle uh, way to refer to the last flight, and then uh, aspects of the NASA meatball, which you know once again represents uh, after our flight 135 flights uh, uh, for the program, uh, which is the lion's share of NASA space flights. So, uh, and I think the last big factor was we wanted to make it relatively simple, not too busy. Uh, some patches are busier than others, and. Uh, we just wanted to kind of keep it a little bit simple. So we hope folks like it. We hope uh, it honors the space shuttle program and, uh, and the men and women that have worked there. So if you think back of about 134, 135 space shuttle flights, uh, what do you think are some of the most significant moments from the space shuttle's history? Well, I, you know, the space shuttle, for me personally, that is the space vehicle that I grew up with. Uh, it's really the only one I remember. Uh, I have some some memories of Skylab, but really nothing prior to that. But Space Shuttle's been around my whole adult life. 
Uh, but I have to start with STS-1, uh, an unflown vehicle, uh, and those two men getting on board and flying that, trusting that the engineering was correct, trusting that the design was correct, trusting that all the safety measures were in place, uh, to me is just amazing. I, I, I'm not sure if we've done anything since then. Uh, and we, I mean the country with a test program, uh, it's just amazing. And then of course, Hubble has done wonders. Uh, I can't say enough about the accomplishments there. Uh, and then the International Space Station, what a magnificent engineering feat to build uh, something of that size in orbit, 225 miles above the surface of the Earth is just amazing. And uh, those things for me will be a, a very lasting legacy uh, to the space shuttle. And as far as we know, there's no other vehicle that could have done all that. What about this vehicle? What, where did Atlantis's place in, in the history of the space shuttle? Well, I, I would like to think that Atlantis obviously will get ideally the last flight of the program so in itself that will seal its legacy uh, it, it's done a, a lion's share of work with regard to the shuttle assembly it's done Hubble uh, it did the last Hubble uh, servicing mission so Atlantis will have a proud proud legacy uh, as far as I'm concerned and uh, we're really looking forward to flying it if you think about the work of the whole shuttle program on all of the orbiters how is that work going to be remembered well, I think, you know, as I said before, uh, you've got the lasting uh, legacy that Hubble, you know, the pictures of our galaxy that would have never, never been seen. Uh, and you've got the space station, which uh, will, will live on for many, many more years. So just in that regard, I think you've got a tremendous history. And then just to look at the engineering feat of building a winged vehicle that goes into space and does things robotically. It, rendezvous with space stations, it carries up huge payloads of supplies, uh, and then returns to Earth and lands on a runway. That in and, in and of itself is a, is a tremendous accomplishment, and I think uh, it'll be a long time before we see another vehicle that does all those things. As far as the International Space Station is concerned, what, what kind of station would we have today if we hadn't had space shuttles to build it with? Well, you think about it. I mean, the space station brought up all the major components uh, with very few exceptions. And there's probably a way we could have built the space station, albeit we'd probably be in the very early stages of construction had it not been for the shuttle, because we could bring up huge trusses, the solar arrays, all the modules, for the most part, all came up in the shuttle payload bay. So. Um, I'm thinking somebody somewhere is smart enough to figure out a way to put a space station together without a shuttle, but I think it would have taken uh, almost uh, an immeasurable amount of time to put it together, given every, everything else that we know. After STS-135, it's going to be up to spaceships from other nations and probably from private industry to get crews and cargo to the space station in the, for the foreseeable future. That's right? correct. Right. As an American astronaut, how do you feel about the future of the International Space Station? Oh, I think the future's in, in great hands. Uh, you know, we've known about the end of the space shuttle program for quite a while now, and uh, some of the best folks we have are working in the space station program planning all these different vehicles and all the right kinds of supplies and all the right things that need to be put on orbit in order to sustain the space station. We have our Russian partners who are going to provide uh, initially uh, provide rides for our folks up to space station and back and then the plan is is for the commercial folks to to pick up some of that slack in the in the very near future uh, and continue uh, flights to the International Space Station so I think uh, you know and if you add the you know the Europeans with the automated transfer vehicle the Japanese with with their transfer vehicle I think we're in we're in really good shape do you remember where you were when STS-1 took off and how you felt about that? Yeah, I was in school. I was, uh, I believe, a freshman in uh, high school when STS-1 took off. And, and uh, I think that was the only flight they flew with a white external tank. So the entire stack was white like that. And it was just unbelievable to see this, what you know looked like to a teenager, an airplane that was going to go into space. And it, it just, I've been uh, mesmerized with it ever since, fascinated with it, and obviously uh, I was very interested in heading that direction uh, a little bit later in life, as you can see. <laughs> Do you have a favorite memory out of the space shuttle era? Um, 
Uh, probably a few. Uh, I think selfishly, my first flight was uh, was a pretty fond memory, almost to the point where it seems surreal that I actually did it, um, because it's so much different than anything else I've ever done in my life. Uh, but I would say that that was a that was a great moment. Um, I would also say I, I worked as a Kennedy support uh, personnel down at the uh, down at the Kennedy Space Center, and uh, my first launch was when I was working, uh, and it was STS-109, the first launch I ever saw in person, and that was uh, that was incredible too. So those were probably the two biggest. Shuttles are still going to low Earth orbit, but what they're doing is dramatically different today than when STS-1 kicked off the space shuttle era. Doug, where do you think we're going to go in the, the next era of human space exploration? I hope we go outside of low Earth orbit. I mean, that's, uh, I think why a lot of us got into this business was exploration and uh, seeing what's over the next horizon. And uh, that's what I would personally like to see is let's go explore other worlds. Let's explore the moon. Let's explore an asteroid. Let's explore Mars. Um, to me, that's that is uh, the part of human spaceflight that that really is exciting, and uh, uh, just to see what's over that next bend and around that next curve is uh, is why I originally got into this business. That's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you.